the 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 I've been following the, the the webinars from far away, especially on Facebook, and it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. So thank you, Costas, for inviting me. So what I've planned today is to share with you a bit of my current research in which I investigate a the, the transnational circulation of certain tropes and, and ideas and discourses that are against the concept of the feminist concept of gender. So I'll be discussing these tropes, ideas, and discourses in terms of registering and, and registering. So although the research I'm, 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 I'm sharing with you today is not ethnographic per se, I guess you could classify it as a kind of ethnography of texts or ethnography of an idea. So I've prepared a short a, a text that I'll read for you and then you please feel free to make any questions or comments any criticism is really welcome at this stage of the research so since the dawn of the 21st century feminist and queer vocabulary has gradually entered the public and institution, institutional discourses in various parts of europe and the americas the legalization of same-sex marriages policies against gender-based and homophobic violence, laws prohibiting discrimination against sexual minorities in employment, housing, schooling, and healthcare, the depathologization of homosexuality and trans identities have confronted discriminatory sexual orders and, ex and exclusionary discourses. As feminist and queer demands reach the public sphere, opposition followed in their wake. Albeit not new, uh, mobilizations against gender equality and sexual diversity have recently gained political traction globally, despite their hyperbolic modes of action and conspiracist rhetoric. And examples abound. In 2013, for example, shirtless men organized, uh, uh, demonstrated, uh, uh, sorry, demonstrated against the, leg the legalization of same-sex marriage, adoption, and co-parenting in France. Uh, the performative power of silent, silent assemblies has also been hijacked by far-right groups. In Italy, Slovenia, and France, for example, self-identified guardians of good morals, variously called as Sentinelle di Piedi and Les Sentinelles, which means standing sentinels, have publicly demonstrated their dissatisfaction with equal marriage and reproductive health laws by doing silent readings in public squares. While in Brazil for a lecture on democracy and populism, Judith Butler in 2017, Judith Butler was met by a horde of protesters who staged a medieval witch hunt against gender, as you can see in, the v in this video. So similar, similar grassroots, uh, sorry, similar grassroots anti-gender movements have mushroomed in Colombia, Costa Rica, Romania, Hungary, Poland, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere. And I really would like to 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 know how what is the state in Greece. So, but we can talk about that later. Powerful institutions have also started incorporating progressive semiosis to advance conservative agendas. The Vatican is a case in point. In 2016, Pope Francis stated that, quote, there are genuine forms of ideological colonization taking place. And one of these, and I will call it clearly by its name, is gender. Today, children, children are taught in school that everyone can choose his or her sex, end quote. The phrase ideological, the sorry. Culturali soltanto guardano il presente, rinegano il passato e non guardano il futuro. Vivono nel momento, non nel. So the phrase ideological colonization has since been used by Pope Francis to refer to institutional demands for gender equality and sexual diversity, as I had uh, uh, as he did in this. Uh, uh, speech in, 20, in 2018. Feminist and, queer scholar, uh, sorry, feminist and queer scholars are familiar with anti-colonial rhetoric. 
It's used by one of the institutions that most profited from colonialism is unsettling, to say the least. However, campaigns against gender and sexual equity have gained public attention by framing their protests as anti-colonialist, anti-authoritarian democratic movements. These mobilizations are, are, loosely, are loosely linked by what is called gender ideology, genderism, gender theory, LGBT lobby, or various forms of, of different, various different signifiers. Deployed as a trope to anathemize feminist, queer, and trans agendas, gender ideology lumps together various conservative values to reaffirm cis heteropatriarchal conceptions of gender, sex, and sexuality, while simultaneously pro protecting its users from accusations of homophobia and misogyny. Paternotti and Quad, in a book published in 2017, explained that gen the gender ideology formula works as, one, a discourse, two, a political strategy harnessing support for far-right populist groups, and three, a transnational phenomenon with hazardous national effects. As a discourse, gender ideology transforms feminist and LGBTQI plus policies into a totalitarian scheme to destroy the nuclear family and draw, ch and draw children into a cultural revolution. This is done via discursive maneuvers that turn human rights concepts inside out to mean their opposites. In this talk, I draw upon Susan Gao's work on the ideolog ideological processes of clasping, relaying, and grafting uh, to offer an analysis of the origins of anti-genderism anti as we know it today. Contemporary, contemporary anti-gender campaigns and their modes of action are well documented. But as Susan Gao in 2021 notes, an analysis of how this, this discourse emerged and how it shifts shape as it circulates is in urgent order. In this talk, I take up this challenge by investigating early anti-gender texts and their circulation. My aim is to understand how these different texts are bound together into a dangerous sexuality that challenges the precarious enfranchisement of women, queer, and trans people. Gender ideology, the formula gender ideology, has been variously identified as an empty or floating signifier, a rhetorical device, a specter, a discursive field of action, and a car caricatural assemblage of rhetorical of rhetoric sorry of rhetorical tropes by Bernini in 2020. This conceptual diversity testified to its elusiveness and political pliability as a signifier. Anything that runs counter to, to cis heteronormative views of the social world may become its signified. Acolytes of this view use the language of human rights and the democratic tenets of the free circulation of ideas and non-discrimination to justify their opposition to gender equality and sexual freedom and to embed religious morals within politics and policymaking. While they claim that feminist, queer, and trans activists manipulate language, anti-genderists anti creatively attach their own meanings onto well-established rights and anti-discrimination repertoires. The analytical toolkit that linguistic anthropologists have developed is particularly useful to the task of, under, of understanding these, these discursive strategies and designing ways to counter them. To this end, I propose that anti-genderism functions as a register, uh, namely a conventionalized aggregate of co-occurring texts and expressive forms of which gender ideology is the most famous shibboleth. Asif Aga uh, in 20, uh, 2007, uh, 2007 explains that, quote, and I quote, registers are cultural modes of action that link diverse behavioral signs to inactable effects, including persona, interpersonal relationships, and types of conduct, end quote. Register, registers emerge over time from activities in which, and I quote, forms and values become differentiable from the rest of, of, of the language, namely recognizable as distinct links to typifiable social, social persona and practices for a given population of speakers. And I end quote, Aga, uh, and that's a quote from, from Aga. Gender ideology specifically has been enregistered 
through mimicking feminist, queer, and trans texts while resignifying them along the way. Particularly relevant in the enregistered ment of gender ideology are the semiotic processes Gao refers to as clasping, relaying, and drafting. Uh, the emergence of a register relies on the production of metapragmatic labels, for example, aggressive, for, for typified figures, for example, feminist. So aggressive feminist would be a metapragmatic figure of personhood. According to Gao, clasping, and I quote, creates or recreates an exertion of authority that is keenly felt by those competing to categorize persuasively as well as by those who are thereby classified and characterized, end quote. In other words, by linking the, uh, the arena of action to the objects they name, register, registers forge figures of personhood through associations to modes of speech and action. As Gao explains, once established, registers or fragments of a register that are used at one arena of social organization are taken up by other institutionally distant and dependent organizations, bridging different arenas of social action through relays. In ideological terms, and I quote, uh, and I quote uh, Susan Gao here, relaying invites and displays alliances among groups and organizations, end quote. As, as we will see in a moment, Anti-genderism juxtaposes diverse institutions and ideologies, such as the UN, the Vatican, anti-abortion organization, anti uh, organizations, anti-communism, nativism, nationalism, and so on and so, forth, and so forth, in ways that serve to smooth over the register's appar apparent mass, giving it legitimacy and authority. As it circulates, the register binds different institutions and groups together giving them some degree of coherence and shared modes of acting, speaking, and seeing reality. Central to these modes is the way anti-genderists refashion language from institutions and groups they disparage through graftings. According to Susan Gall, grafting is an ideological maneuver that, and I quote, draws on or attempts to ride and sometimes transform the social cultural authority established by already existing and highly legitimated institutions and their discourses, end quote. Transformations in the registers in Mexico field derive from implants that piggyback on the authority of texts and institutions the register opposes. A case in point is precisely the phrase gender ideology, which uses words from feminism and Marxism to counter gender equality and the political left. In this formula, gender ideology, ideology, which is different from the feminist understanding of gender ideology, that's why it always appears in quotation marks, ideology is used in the most Marxist fashion to refer to, to, refer to distortions of a biological God-driven reality advanced by an intellectual elite. The, these in turn, requires anti-genderists to review the true meaning of the words feminist and queer activists supposedly manipulate. Gao, in, in, in her recent publications, notes that these moments of enregisterment always happen simulta simultaneously. For the ease of the discussion, however, I'll analyze them separately as I probe an archive of anti-gender texts. My primary concern is the early stages of this register. I focus on texts and people that were central in crafting anti-genderism and forging gender ideology. My, my focus specifically is on the period between 1995 and 2003. More specifically, I investigate language ideological debates during the 1995 uh, UN Conference on Women and their, uptake, uh, and their uptake by the Vatican through to 2003. The literature seems to suggest this was the period during which anti-genderism found a discursive common ground. Due to intense theoretical work by Pope Benedict XVI, but now Pope Emeritus, and Pope Francis, anti-gender texts have tied religious and secular fa factions of society together, who now attempt to institutionalize a version of gender equality and sexual diversity in various national contexts. Brazil is, is one of the most apt examples of what is happening under Bolsonaro. So on to clasping at the UN. 
uh, scholars seem to agree that the current shape of anti-gender campaigns was gestated in the, mid uh, in the mid 90s within the United Nations. As a reaction against terms such as gender instead of men and women, male and female, partnerships and families instead of family in the singular, which were used in, in the 1995 conference on population in Cairo, the Holy See orchestrated alliances among anti-abortion groups, Catholic and Muslim countries to question the use of gender during the preparation meetings for the 1995 conference on women. At the Beijing conference, US journalist Bayo O'Leary played an important role in challenging the inclusion of gender in the platform for action. Her book, The Gender, Ag the Gender Agenda, Redefining Equality, published in 1995, is pivotal in the enregistrement of anti-genderism as it champions the production of the totalitarian feminist as a metapragmatic label. Although O'Leary does not use the phrase gender ideology per se, her vocal anti-feminist stance put her in the public limelight. In the opening pages of the book, O'Leary asserts the following. Without fanfare or debate, the word gender has been substituted for the word sex. We used to talk about sex discrimination, but now it's gender discrimination. Sex has a secondary meaning, sexual intercourse or sexual activity. Gender sounds more delicate and refined. But, and now that's an interesting part, but if you think the change signals a renaissance of new Victorian sensitivity, you could, you could not be more wrong. The militant feminists have learned from their defeats. When they couldn't sell their radical ideology to ordinary women, they repackaged it. Now, they are very careful not to reveal their actual goals. They have worked themselves in positions of power within existing institutions. They intend to achieve their ends, not by open confrontations, but by changing the meaning of words. O'Leary adamantly opposes the cunning semantic strategies of feminists to make gender mean socially constructed roles of women and men. According to her, this kind of semantic repackaging is a, way of, is a way to advance the destruction of natural and biological differences. This in turn would lead to the decay of the heterosexual family, tolerance of homosexuality, and the depopulation of the world. Her tone is always very alarmist and conspiracist, a style embraced by anti-gender groups today that seems to work as a type of prosody to their, to their register. Uh, by depicting feminists as distorting real, real, sorry, reality with concepts that disguise their true intentions, Bayo O'Leary projects a way of speaking onto the group and thus forges a metapragmatic label. Not only do feminists speak a, a, speak a language of their own, but they use it in violent ways to further their objectives. According to O'Leary, this is so because, and I quote, feminism, uh, I, I'm quoting Bayo O'Leary here, because feminism is a giant rationalization created by hurt women to justify their anger, grudges, and self-destructive behavior, end quote. Uh, this conundrum, this conundrum over the semantics of the word gender laid bare political and epistemological conflicts at the UN. In this context, O'Leary's anti-feminist writings prepared the ground for the anti-gender register as it is deployed today. Importantly, she, contrib she contributed to the construction of the totalitarian feminist figure whose cunning use of words and aggressive speech style is anathema to what she calls authentic women, who believe that, and I quote O'Leary, men and women are different but completely equal, complementary in nature. While the pro-family anti-feminist forces orchestrated by the Holy See wanted gender to be uh, defined, to be unequivocally defined as male and female, the two sexes of the human being, and that's what O'Leary says, feminists and other progressive delegates strive to keep the broad definition as it was well known and had been used in UN documents before the, confer the, the conference on women in Beijing. After much deliberation, the contact group created to propose a definition 
announced that, and I quote, in the context of the platform for action, the commonly understood meaning of the word gender refers to the socially constructed roles played and expected of men in society, as well as the responsibilities and opportunities of men and women arising from these roles, end quote. For, for O'Leary, and she states that clearly in the book, for O'Leary and her accomplices, this is a non-definition. In any case, gender was capped in the Beijing Platform for Action, with, which later played an important role in gender mainstreaming. Keeping the term in a UN document, however, motivated an even stronger offensive from the Vatican. And now I move on to relaying discursive fields of action. Uh, defeated in Beijing, uh, sorry, defeated in Beijing, the Vatican and its anti-feminist forces did not rest their case. The authoritarian feminist caricature O'Leary had, had breathed life into is still needed to be made a more solid and credible figure. By the time the Beijing conference took place, the Vatican was very familiar with this discursive strategy, which was instrumental in its refashioning of its, dogma, uh, of its dogmas about the role of women in society and in the church. This, famili this familiarity with anti-feminist rhetoric prepared the ground for relays motivated by the Vatican's interest in countering uh, secular, secular, secularism. And I'm sorry if, if you have nightmares late, later, later this evening. I didn't really want to spoil your, your, your evening with these images, but well, anyway, we need to know these people. So Pius XII uh, in 1950, uh, made an opposition between true and false women's emancipation. Paul VI in 1965 uh, produced the cleavage between authentic and intemperate feminism. John Paul II, especially in 1995, made a call for, and I quote, for a new feminism that acknowledges and affirms the true genius of women in every aspect of life and society and promotes women's dignity, and I end quote. And Benedict XVI's call to counter the idea, and, and I quote, ideology of women's empowerment by recognizing biological determinism have played an important role in masking the Vatican's view of women's subordination to men. The discourse of equal in dignity but different and complementary nature relays distinct arenas of action, namely theology and biology. This relay was particularly bolstered by John Paul II in 146 general assemblies and was elaborated in apostolic letters to the role of, uh, about the role of women and families within the church. So John Paul II was really invested in fighting feminism and the changes that feminism produ produces. Benedict XVI's anthropology, what he calls anthropology, referring to the nature of the human person, also served to parallel theology and biology in a coherent discourse. In this discourse, in this discourse, and I quote Sara Garbagnoli here, theology and natural sciences are, are understood as two different languages that express the same meaning, the, pre, uh, the precepts of natural law defining the structure of reality as created by God and none by human beings through the faculty of the reason, end quote. In this scenario, the first record of the, the, at least the first record I could find. So the first record of the phrase gender ideology seems to be Monseigneur Michel Suyan's book, L'Evangile face au désordre mondial, which means the gospel in the face of world disorder, published in 1997, the same year that uh, the gender agenda was published. In this book, Xu Yans describes gender ideology, which, also, which he also calls uh, ideology de la mort, uh, ideology of death, in this quote. Uh, in this new Marxist dialectic, women will control their fertility. Its final objective is to abolish every single class distinction and all differences between men and women. This gender ideology combines thus themes from the socialist ideology in its Marxist rendition with the liberal ideology in its neo-Malthusian form, end quote. 
obvious in, in, in this definition, sorry, obvious, obvious in Shuyan's portrayal is the misrepresentation of feminist theory, a rhetorical maneuver that has become a stronghold of anti-gender register. According to Shuyan's, and I quote, it is unacceptable that the UN and its agencies, uh, sorry, it's unacceptable that the UN and its agencies, active accomplices of this ideological dictatorship, take sides with a minority of radical feminists of dubious representativeness against the immense majority of people of good, of good judgment. Shuyan's depiction of gender ideology provides the register with important discursive tools that are constantly, that are constantly revived in one form or another in anti-gender demonstrations across the globe today. First, its conspiracist content and its nationalist frame portray gender equality and sexual diversity as a foreign threat to the authenticity of a given nation. Second, the juxtaposition of feminism to Marxism, socialism, the specter of dictatorship depicts gender ideology as an anti-democratic plot to revive communist, uh, communist ideals. As such, Gender ideology provides a vocabulary that contains sparks of anti-communist and anti-colonial anti-colonialist texts, relaying apparently incompatible arenas of action and binding them into a coherent textuality whose aim is to block legal, legal in, and social reforms. In an obvious response to the Beijing platform of action, I know you're going, I'm sorry about these pictures, I'm sure you're gonna have some nightmares with this man, but anyway. Uh, in an obvious response to the Beijing platform for action, Cardinal Alfonso Lopez Trujillo, this one, then prefect for the Council of the Family, headed the production of the ecclesiastical document Familia Matrimonio e Unione de Facto, which means family, marriage, and de facto unions. According to this text, gender ideology in Italian teoria del gender, using the English word, threatens, and I quote, the foundations of the family and other interpersonal relations, since it promotes the gradual cultural and human disorganization of matrimony by class, uh, and I end quote, by classifying as family, all kinds of consensual unions and by justifying any sexual attitude, including homosexuality, end quote. In Italy, as well as other countries, such as Hungary, Poland, Romania, the use of the English word instead of a correlate in the national language has become a strategy to frame gender equality and sexual diversity as colonial impositions that run counter to native gendered regimes. The publication of Familia Matrimonio Unione di Facto is a milestone for, for the global anti-gender movement because it makes explicit the Vatican's plan to recover power over family, marriage, and sexuality. However, giving credibility, giving credibility to the apocalyptic, apocalyptic future that feminists envisage through semantic engineering demands the discursive maneuvers of its own. The Vatican, of course, took this job on. Remarkable in the anti-gender register is the adoption and distortion of well-established rights and anti-discrimination vocabulary to contest rights and to promote discrimination. This is strategy. <clears throat> Sorry. This strategy has been enhanced by the Vatican in this book, The Lexicon, Ambiguous and Debatable Terms Regarding Family Life and Ethical, question, and ethical Questions. Published in 2003, 2003, and translated into several languages, it may be considered the anti-gender dictionary, providing the register a violent vocabulary and a twisted semantics by using antonyms as the real meaning of progressive words. And then I'll focus, uh, I'll use the, the lexicon to study the, the, the graftings and the way that the, the anti-gender movements turn words inside out. Uh, triggered by O'Leary's argument that feminists manipulate language, the lexicon, a text of a thousand pages written, written by more than 70 Catholic experts on bioethics, psychoanalysis, sexuality, and law, is rife, is rife with, with terms that we know very well. Take, for instance, this quote. 
who is, which comes from the preface of the lexicon, who is not opposed to all forms of discrimination. This seems to, this seems to derive from respect for human rights. However, in the name of non-discrimination, bills are introduced for de facto unions and for those between homosexuals and lesbians, with, even with the possibility of adopting children. In his preface to the lexicon, sorry, in his preface to the lexicon, Cardinal, Cardinal Trujillo lets us, lets us glimpse the main underlying textual strategy of the whole book, actually. The use of well-established rights and anti-discrimination talk to, advan to advance a discriminatory view of women's empowerment and sexual diversity. The Vatican uses the lexicon to design two important discursive resources for the anti-gender register. First, uh, through relays, it approximates religion to science, which gives legitimacy to its view of sexual orders, uh, sexual orders as transcendent and immutable. Trujillo affirms that the lexicon, and I quote, is published in accord with technical and lexicographical criteria, end quote. Any serious lexicographer, however, would question the book's scientific validity. All the chapters offer the author's interpretation of the words within Catholic theology and are not based on any empirical observation of the lexicon of a language, thus disguising ideological content through scientific jargon. Another semiotic strategy used in the lexicon involves an ideological move in which, and I quote uh, Susan Gao here, uh, an ideological move in which linguistic, social, and material practices that are indexical of existing authoritative personnel and organization provide the authority for the graffitings or practices added to them from another area. Yeah, I end quote. In other words, through graffitings, registered users may cut up texts from other registers and thus invert their indexical field while riding on the authority of the people or organizations they disparage. In this talk, I offer just a glimpse of how the lexicon hijacks rights and non-discrimination talk to question rights and promote discrimination. A case in point is the entry on homosexuality and homophobia by, the, by Tony Anatrella, a priest and psychotherapist infamous for his opposition to gay rights in France. According to him, and I quote, homosexuality, homosexuality represents a serious psychological handicap in sexual growth, end quote. Despite this, homosexual groups constitute, according to Anatrella, an active minority that becomes dominant without being the majority through intimidation rather than dialogue. Uh, an index of this uh, domination is the use of language to make, according to him, to make heterosexuals feel guilty and to prevent debate. Anatrella argues that the concept of a homophobia was invented by activists as a linguistic device to manipulate history, law, and democracy, and to, uh, and I quote, and to make us believe that those who choose this lifestyle, meaning homosexuality, are constantly threatened in such a way that anyone who thinks homosexuality poses a, so a social problem is stigmatized. After all, according to Anatrella, there is nothing discriminatory, and I'm quoting, there is nothing discriminatory in saying that only men and women can marry and become parents, end quote. In a cunning rhetorical reversal, Anatrella explains that this kind of harassment promoted by homosexuals, and I quote, goes back to a primary fantasy which they depend upon, heterophobia, the fear of the other sex, of the stranger to one sex. And uh, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, the lexicon is the first instance, the first record of the use of, of heterophobia, the word heterophobia, in an institutional document. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> in a nutshell, Homophobia is just a psychotic invention. The real problem is heterophobia, according to the lexicon. Co-opting rights and non-discrimination register grants anti-genderism and, and, and gender ideology the discursive and institutional authority such vocabulary has acquired over the years, 
while simultaneously inverting its semantics. In such a way, a reversal in the semiotic and discursive fields is accomplished. The oppressors become the oppressed. The lexicon may be considered the most important repository of anti-genderist, uh, sorry, uh, the lexicon may be considered the most important repository of anti-genderist rhetorical formulae, register forms, ideological structures, and discursive strategies. It is no surprise then that, that its contents and forms have been replicated in campaigns against gender ideology globally. So I'm, move, I'm, I'm moving on to the final uh, part of my talk. So in this talk, I have argued that anti-genderism is best understood as a conventionalized aggregate of expressive forms and inactable person times, that is, a register. Its current shape has been formed over a long period through complex metasemiotic activities by various actors and institutions. A byproduct of the language ideological debates over the, over the meaning of gender within the UN in the mid-90s, the, mid the emergence of anti-genderism anti relies on carefully crafted metapragmatic figures such as the authoritarian feminist, the endangered nuclear family, and the threatened child, who populate an apocalyptic future in which, uh, in which heterosexuals are, are under siege. One of the central stakeholders in this process of enregisterment is the Vatican, which capitalizes on gender ideology as a strategy to mobilize against social reforms regarding reproduction, sexual health, marriage, and education. This is done via a handful of semiotic maneuvers. Central to these strategies is the use of well-established uh, well -established rights and non-discrimination vocabulary to abolish rights through a discriminatory stance. <laughs> Anti-gender zealots ride on the authority of democratic registers, which makes their conspiracist image of reality seem bizarrely plausible. The, conven the conventionalization of these metasemiotic enterprises into a meaningful whole uh, is testified by the, by the wide transnational circulation of the anti-gender register. Until roughly 2010, the formula gender ideology and other shibboleths of anti-genderism anti were only used within inner circles of the church, such as in ecclesiastical documents and Catholic newspapers. Nowadays, however, gender ideology is used by far-right populists and neoliberal pundits, for example. Far-right far populists, such as Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil and Victor Urban, in Hungary, Marine Le Pen in France, and Lega Nord in, it in Italy, and others, mobilize fears about a decaying society to further nativist and or nationalist projects that depend on immutable pa patriarchal orders. Neoliberal pundits use the metapragmatic figures of the endangered family or and the threatened child to extract the family from the state's purview, privatizing its every need. It is no surprise then that the outbreak of the anti-gender register in many national contexts tends to follow public discussions of equal marriage laws, uh, reproductive rights, and non-discriminatory school curricula that may challenge the hegemony of heterosexual familial relations within the state. Once the anti-gender register finds its way, finds its way into finds its way into national contexts. It easily overlaps with other registers such as scientific denialism, anti-intellectualism, disinformation mongering, and vac uh, vaccine uh, hack that, hack, uh, vac and, and vaxxers are, are also uh, very, very into this discourse, which depend on the invention of fictitious enemies. These register crossovers offer open, open terrain for the entrenchment of cis heteropatriarchal regimes. Attending to how inchoate texts have been conventionalized and turned into a cohesive whole that has been amassing political power in several countries is an important endeavor to resist the register's institutionalization into exclusionary policies. Challenging anti-genderist's portrayal of feminists, trans, and queer people as enemies is not easy, though. The analytical toolkit for close textual analysis that social linguists and discourse analysts have developed, have developed should prove useful in fortifying ways of 
counteraction that challenge the textuality uphold, upholding anti-genderism and its performative power. Thank you very much. I think I have I have spoken more than I should, so I'm sorry if, if, no, if it was not too all, long. Not at all. It was um, almost exactly 45 minutes, uh, which is um, what was um, uh, supposed to last. Uh, it was um, really inspiring, although a bit sad at times to hear all of this. And um, before I give um, the floor to our um, audience for questions and comments, I would like to mention something. When you talked about colonizing uh, national or nativist regimes of normalcy, of normality, <clears throat> of course, in Greece, we have our own. Uh, and um, I had a chance to see how hot an issue that was during the 2001 through 2009 gay pride parades in Belgrade, where um, a part of, of the local um, right wing political and um, other elites were discussing about, were basically raving about how new um, wars were introduced in Serbia as if the issue of homosexuality was an issue that was introduced with gay parades and not the results of people claiming for rights, um, regardless of whether we are pro con or indifferent towards by parades, which then made the very parade a very big issue. Um, which polarized people from within the gay community in Serbia. Um, it, it, it was very interesting. For me, this idea of colonizing the, the naive other uh, is, is of particular interest. But this, yes, it is interesting and, and, and very powerful too, isn't it? Because yeah. this this discourse of colonization is quite strong, especially in Eastern, Eastern Europe, where anti-genderism and gender ideology has, have become quite strong in Poland, in, in, in Romania, and in, in, in the other countries in Eastern, in Eastern Europe. But interestingly, this discourse of colonization doesn't really take hold in Brazil, which has been colonized. <laughs> What, the, what is actually quite strong in Brazil is this anti-communist and anti-dictatorship discourse. Uh -huh. uh, be, and of course, that has to do with the, with the recent history of the country, because we had a 21-year dictatorship whose main, uh, whose main purpose, according to the military, was to protect the country from communism. That's right. Yeah. So now everything, and, and this has... And, and this discourse has been revived now under Bolsonaro because he is very much anti-communism and he's very much linked to the military. Now, everything, absolutely everything, and that's something that I find extremely interesting, how these different registers overlap. Absolutely anything that is slightly is re regarded close to the left, to the political left, is considered communist. Absolutely anything. And then there's, there is this specter that haunts the population. So it's really, really frightening, but also quite rich as a phenomenon for us to, 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 to take a look at. And as sociolinguists, I think we have much to contribute here because as I've tried to show, and language plays a very important part in this debate because it's basically a process of resignification on the one hand, and on the other hand, the process of expanding the indexical field of certain, of certain signs, such as gender and ideology, to include basically everything that the far right or the conservative right or the religious right is against. So I think we can contribute quite a lot in this in this regard to understand not only to understand how this uh, discourse and this register and this processes of of semantic expansion happen but also how to counter them because it's a very alluring 
this course. Yes, of course, and I think that um, you it's, um, it might be tempting to different kinds of ears, to different sets of ears for different reasons. Um, just one more comment. When you talked about uh, Susan Gall's work on clasping, relaying, and grafting, I think um, I found, it, I, I, I don't know the particular work, I think, but um, to me, um, clasping sounded like an equivalent to collocation gender ideology as a collocation to mean a particular thing uh it taps on that but it's it's a little bit broader in my understanding yes. because yes. what she, what she refers to clasping is not necessarily uh, a collocation of words like gender plus ideology but a collocation of a figure and a way of speaking right and a way of acting so, for example, one of the one of the clasps that is very common here is the is the authoritarian feminist, like feminists that are portrayed as having a very aggressive speech style of inventing, uh, engineering new meanings to words. So, it has to do with collocations in the sense that it it puts two things together, two areas or two people or two words together but it is it is a bit broader in terms of semiotics i guess absolutely i th I, th I think the way you presented it i mean it begins with domains that are being connected but then in the end the, I, I had exactly authoritarian feminist in mind which in the end at the end of the day you cannot even use descriptively because it is colonized by this specific discourse Exactly. Cool. Which exactly. is even more interesting at the end. Exactly. So um, uh, I would like to give the floor to our um, audience. Um, I have promoted many of you to panelists, so you should be able, almost all of you, so you should be able to actually talk if you want. Uh, not only um, phrase your questions in chat form, which you absolutely can. There is also the Q&A section, which I think nobody has typed anything in. Is there anybody in our audience here or our audience online who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Oh, yes, it's Jesus Pablo. Kalispera, Salus Asimakopoulos. Kalispera, hello. I'm, uh... I'm not entirely sure whether I've become a panelist, but it's probably because I'm on yes. my mobile. You probably have because you're able to talk without being given extra um, extra rights. So go ahead, please. We can hear you. No, I just uh, no. I mean, I mean, this is really fascinating. I mean, it, I, it will take me a bit of time to 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 digest all this information because it's really you know it's it's quite new to me as well. I just felt that this is like as as a way of approaching you know, meaning more generally, I think that this is highly generalizable. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think, I mean, I was, while we were talking, I mean, I'm also quite into uh, LGBTIQ matters and transgender issues and, and things like that. But, but at the same time, I'm also working a lot on migration. And it seems to me that the same semantic change occurs when it comes to referring to, I don't know, refugees, to, 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 to any sort of minority or so so called you know conceived minority uh, population and i'm pretty sure that this line of investigation could apply you know much more generally you know to other um, populations as well i mean so yeah thanks for the inspiration i mean i don't have a question per se thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. now that you mentioned trans this is something yeah. that uh interests me quite a lot like this discourse, and this is something that I haven't touched upon in this talk, but it's something that has been in the back of my mind to look into in more detail. What is particularly striking more recently is that this anti-gender uh, discourse and register has been used by feminists. Yes. Gender, cri gender critical feminists, or also known as trans-exclusionary radical feminists. Yep. And, uh, that's quite worrying, isn't it? Because those are people who should be progressive, but then they are 
getting very close. It's also a kind of clasp, actually a kind of relay. So groups of feminists who are against the concept of gender, which is something odd at least, are getting quite close to far right groups who oppose most of the things feminists fight for, such as reproductive rights. Yeah, but so I, I think, it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, at, at the same time, I think it's it's also, you know, it, it, it all depends on the frame of reference of someone. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm thinking of like concepts like, I don't know, homo nationalism and things like that, that, you know, it's all relative to what it is that you're trying to, yeah. to argue at the end of the day, right? I mean, um and to a certain extent you know we are all when when you're dealing with critical studies and, and all this stuff i mean you're trying to convince people so yeah I'm, I'm not entirely sure how it would fit the picture but i i find it you know i think i think that it's there's a lot going on there so yeah thank you i mean <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's thank probably you. stuff but <laughs> thanks um uh, we have um, a comment or a question here from my colleague with us <laughs> Yes, it's um, it's uh, after the the comment made by the previous speaker who referred to the questions of refugee question of refugees, and I was thinking while hearing you that the same scheme that you um, schema the, the same yes, model schema. that you presented, in the sense that you have the this discourse uh, claiming it being a discourse on rights in order to. Um, say that there's part, uh, you know, feminists and all that should not have so many rights, but they they uh, they develop their argument by reference to rights, and it's the same model that you have uh, for refugees, for example, because here in Greece or in France or Le Pen, they were saying, yes, you were talking about the rights of refugees, what about the rights of the locals? So you have the same. I think it's it's it's. Um, uh, how do you say a schema, uh, uh, a way of arguing that is 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 quite similar mm -hmm. that they appropriate the discourse on rights, but not in the sense that we should uh, expand rights, but you know there is an opposition rights to specific rights to specific groups. Yes, yes, and um, the first is that, and the, the second is. The, uh, it is a neologism or a neologism. Uh, I don't know how one would uh, translate this in English, but uh, there is there is mongering rights mongering. There is even because uh, you know uh, things that you you may have in in uh, Hungary or other uh, places that you have referred to. You also have here in Greece uh, from our uh, members of uh, the current government who, for example, Bogdanos uh, has developed a discourse that's quite close to the one you presented against gender and all that. And at the same time, there's this word that they have forged, which is the word vikiomatismos and the, 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 the proponents of rights or, or the discourse of, of rights, that we've, we've had enough of them. Uh, the uh, the thing is that that we've have had it, we've had it enough of this to, thing on rights. So thank you very much. But it was just to to uh, uh, you know, add some things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You 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 touch upon two important things that I guess are first the the the, the, the issue of rights, and I actually come to think that what is behind not necessarily behind, but what undergirds the, 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 this anti-genderism discourse, gender ideology, but also recent discourses about immigrants and, and, and other, other groups is actually a contestation of rights. What we are witnessing here is that the notion of human rights is up for grabs, right? So these groups, and usually far-right groups, they appropriate words that are already quite authoritative in terms of right, and restrict, sometimes restrict the indexical field, but also sometimes expand the, the indexical field. So what I think would be interesting to take a look at is how exactly this 
notion of human rights is being put up for grabs and contestation by different groups. For example, Putin has recently given, Vladimir Putin has given, uh, has recently given an interview in which he talks about reverse discrimination, for example. Of course, he talks about gender ideology, but also reverse discrimination, which is something that doesn't really make sense, does it? But people understand discrimination, which is human rights vocabulary. So they can make an association, what is reverse discrimination? Reverse discrimination would be minoritized groups discriminating against majority groups. So what, if, what I find fascinating, but also frightening is how this idea of human rights is being contested and, and, and redefined. Thank you, Maria. Nick has a question, and then Eduardo Andres Vieira has a question. This is the order. Maria, go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm not feeling very well tonight. I had my vax two days ago. <laughs> I've got a high fever, but anyway, thank you so very much. That was so interesting, everything you said. I, I have been thinking that a very useful parallel is what goes on these days with the anti-vax movement. It's also headed by the church, by the far right, all these conservative uh, forces. And it's so sad, it makes me so sad. It's so outrageous that people uh, let themselves be led by this pack of wolves, you know because they think their interests are being served. And if you, if you were to look at it, I, I'm, I think you would find all these dimensions uh, you've talked about uh, in terms of anti-gender movement. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Yes, uh, this is actually quite, um, this is something else that interests me quite a lot. And I have been seeing this quite a lot in my data is this, um, crossovers between different registers. So the anti-gender register, which is the one that I'm most interested in, cross fertilizes with anti-intellectualism. Usually those who are against gender are also against intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Usually, very frequently, those who are against the idea of gender and gender equality because it's ideological colonization or because it's uh, ideological dict dictatorship are also against vaccination. But then again, uh, what, is, what undergirds this is a very specific understanding of rights. For example, I'm, I'm not sure how that, that, that played out in Greece, but now there is um, also a transnational movement called transvaccinated. Have you heard of that? No. <laughs> so trans vaccinated no. are people appropriating the meaning of trans as, as identifying as the, 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 the oh, gender that you were not assigned at birth. Yeah. So trans vaccinated people is this group of people who say that they feel vaccinated, although they haven't been vaccinated. So they oh, have the right oh, of oh. not being vaccinated. Is that a Brazilian sort of thing? Because we know Bolsonaro is dead again. It's really weird. And then you said it's you said that it's outrageous that people believe in these things. I don't. It is outrageous to us, of course. Yeah, it is. It is. But if we take a look at how these discourses and how these ideas are are, are, are carefully crafted yeah. and how how alluring and enticing they are, because yeah. it's about liberty, it's about freedom, yeah, it's right. about protecting the family, pot yeah. protecting the children. Yeah, right, and uh, rights like uh, it, It's easy to, to convince yes. people that, yeah, it's easy to convince people that this alarmist and conspiracist yeah, right. discourse right. is actually true. <laughs> so, this was an aside in Greek about I was taking a comment on something purely Greek, yeah, right. More right, thank you, Marianne. Let's give the floor to Eduardo. 
Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Of course. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for your talk and everyone for organizing it. So it was very refreshing indeed. Um, I have uh, two questions. One is uh, very much related to your presentation, and the other one is a broader one about the Brazilian um, climate when it comes to all that. So the first one is, can we see the, the image in the discourse of Pope Francis as a form of grafting since he's been a very controversial figure to both the more conservative church and the LGBTQ communities worldwide because he has already said things as, okay, we should look at those people, that's his words, right? So we should look uh, to, to the community and try to include the community. But then later on, he said, he tries to unsay what he has said. So can we see his image in discourse as a sort of grafting? And then the second one is about the, the Brazilian context. Are there differences between how, for example, Catholics and evangelical people use grafting in this construction of anti-gender discourse in Brazil? Yeah, those, thank you, Eduardo. These are very uh, good questions. I, I have never thought of the figure of Pope Francis as a kind of grafting. He does work as uh, a not, a, 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 a producer of different craftings like ideological colonizations. But thinking of it, I may think that, I tend to think that he could be considered, his figure as a Pope could be considered as a kind of grafting, as produced through graftings. Because mm -hmm. of course, he doesn't, he doesn't use all the Pope paraphernalia. He's someone like everyone else. And his election as a pope is also not um, something that we have to, you should we should take for granted. Yeah. Uh, especially he was elected as a pope in 2013, wasn't it? It was a an area and 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 a historical period in which Latin America had been advancing quite a lot in terms of LGBT rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And that was also the moment that gender ideology uh, started to circulate in, in Latin America. So his election as a Pope is not a coincidence. They yeah. needed, the Vatican needed a, a Latin American Pope. Oh, yeah. Because of course, they, they feel they are losing their hold in Latin America because of sec secular, secular, secularism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful with this Pope. <laughs> yeah. And now the other question is if, if there are differences between Catholic groups and evangelical groups in terms of their use of the anti-gender register. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's also a very interesting question um, because this discourse, like for those who are not familiar with Brazil, I gather it, it, Eduardo is Brazilian, aren't you? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so for those of, for those of you in the audience who are not familiar with Brazil or with the Brazilian context, and especially in terms of religion, uh, Brazil has always been a very Catholic country, but the, the, the Catholic Church has been losing followers for neo-Pentecostal and, and evangelical churches, and they have been losing quite a lot of followers. What is interesting here, so the, both uh, religions have always been enemies. The Catholic Church always spoke very bad about the evangelical churches and the evangelical churches always spoke very badly about the Catholic Church. So they have never been any kind of dialogue between them. However, this register, although it has been championed and created by the Vatican, was easily appropriated by the evangelicals and also, uh, and also secular politicians and, and institutions. So it's, it, it, it allows it, it it allows this product the production of this unexpected coalitions in this case between the Catholic Church and the evangelical churches. And what is interesting in Brazil is that the Catholic Church and Catholic politicians, for example, and Catholic institutions, actors, they don't really take center stage in this debate. They they work behind the scenes. 
those who take the center stage are the evangelical churches and priests and pastors and politicians because they are very vocal about it. Mm -hmm. These people made the, the idea of gender ideology circulate much, circulate widely, wildly and widely mm -hmm. in Brazil, while the Catholic Church, which served as one of the main propellers of the idea, worked behind the scenes. So the way that they speak about gender ideology and gender equality and sexual diversity is very, very similar, mm -hmm. which is also an interesting uh, research topic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yep. Did I answer the question, Eduardo? Yeah, 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 I'm 100%. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a, some, uh, oh, evangelical film. Oh, Mariandi, thank you. It's you writing about an evangelical film in the Guatemalan context. That's very interesting. Temblores, Jairo Bustamante, a very interesting film about Guatemala, the coming out of a middle-aged, middle-class man who's been married for several years, has kids, and how he has to undergo gay conversion under the pressure of the family and the church, of course. Thank you. Well, it seems to me that there is a lot of opportunistic uh, coalitions when it comes to discourses of othering. And uh, I do not think that any particular country or state nation holds um, you know, the reins of this. I think we're all uh, very much accustomed to it in our own national political scenes. We have seen it happening in Greece time and time again. We have seen it happening in the US. Um, even in the last election, uh, where, I mean, no, not in the last election, in the last but one election, um, when Hillary Clinton lost to the Trump. <laughs> I mean, um, it's, it's a very interesting discussion. And I think um, that um, it has broader applications and implications. The refugee crisis, um, the wider set of um, human rights, be that what they may be, gender rights or rights to employment or other things. And I believe um, this has been a very fragile discussion. Um, if there is no other question, I think we should um, say goodbye to Rodrigo, who so graciously um, gave us his time for today's talk at a time Thank you. which is probably like two in the afternoon, the late afternoon in Brazil, five hours apart. I would like to thank all of you, um, the ones of you who are here in the room and the ones of you who are online for being with us tonight. Thank and, you. I would like to thank you all for it. Yes, and remind you that our next talk will be on the 7th of um, December. Uh, and um, the speaker will be Jan Santos. And the last talk of the semester will be with Tomaso Milani on the 14th of December. So we have another two talks before the semester ends. So thank That's you. That's fantastic. All. Thank you. Thank you. It was really a pleasure to be here thank you costas for inviting me and thank you the audience i know it's quite i know it's quite late in in, in your part of the world <laughs> so thank you for for staying so late with me and the questions was, were really interesting and then i'll keep thinking about it thank you very much it was really good have a good evening bye bye good night Bye.